battle for the Pacific started on the 18th of September 1931, when the Japanese Imperial Army began its trail of blood and conquest through the Far East. Here at Mukden in southern Manchuria lay a strategic railway which the Japanese had owned since the Russian-Japanese War in 1905. The Japanese army claimed that the Chinese had sabotaged the railway, so they occupied Mukden. They asked for reinforcements to come north from Korea. The government in Tokyo had already tried to stop the army's advance, but the orders had been deliberately delayed and then ignored. Now the Supreme Command sent in more troops. The government found itself powerless to stop them, and the Japanese marched beyond Mukden to take all Manchuria. There was still no official state of war between China and Japan, but China was in no mood to submit peacefully to having almost a fifth of her territory taken away. For years there had been an official boycott of Japanese goods in Chinese ports, but it had rarely been observed. Now it was imposed rigorously, and it led to renewed fighting. The Japanese demanded that the boycott be lifted, and when their request was refused, they invaded Shanghai and occupied a densely populated part of the dockside area. There was heavy fighting and large areas of the city were laid waste, whilst 30,000 Japanese settlers in Shanghai crowded round the jetties, trying to get out of what promised to turn into a prolonged war. Within two days, the Japanese mounted another invasion, this time at Nanking, a hundred miles north of Shanghai, and at that time the capital city of China. In the north, they had already declared that Manchuria had won its independence from China and would now be called Manchu Kuo. It was only another way of saying that Manchuria was now a colony of Japan. But at Nanking, they once again met stiff opposition and had to send in reinforcements. The Japanese now decided to call for a truce. The Japanese could feel well satisfied for the moment. Manchuria, renamed Manchu Kuo, was theirs. Now they could march west on Mongolia, protected by the Great Wall of China. Within China, the nationalist government could do nothing to contest Japan's control over the new state of Manchu Kuo. Chiang Kai-shek had his own problems fighting Mao Zedong's communists. To some extent, it was Mao who held the key, for it was when he agreed to make common cause with Chiang Kai-shek against the Japanese in 1936 that the uneasy peace with Japan came to an end. On the 7th of July, 1937, the Japanese moved south of the Great Wall of China and took Peking. They invaded Shanghai again. Within two months, they had over 150,000 men in China. This time, it was a full-scale war, and the Japanese looked for a decisive battle. Their attention centered on Nanking, Chiang Kai-shek's capital. In December 1937, Nanking fell to the Japanese army. The Chinese nationalists had suffered a severe setback, and not only in terms of arms and men. The loss of Nanking led to the loss of all China's wealthiest cities and ports. But Nanking was also an indication of what was to come. Some of the worst atrocities of the war were committed here. The Chinese nationalists fought where they could, but they were soon forced to take to the rivers and the mountains of the interior where the Japanese mechanized transport could not follow. Here they trained and re-equipped. 
Then, by using the difficult terrain and with equipment supplied by Germany, they managed to bring the war to a stalemate. The Japanese had neither the men nor the money to take on the Chinese in the mountains. Already they were having to move men back to Manchuria, where fighting had broken out again with the Soviet Union. So, in southern China, the Japanese decided to dig in and starve the Chinese out. But the Japanese army, in turn, was already being starved of oil. And now it was the turn of the Imperial Navy. The United States, aware of the dangers of Japan in the Pacific, cut the oil exports which had been aiding Japan's conquest in China. By the fall of 1941, Japan had only six months oil left because of the United States embargo. And so the fleet set out on the massive gamble to take on the United States. target was Pearl Harbor. Here the American forces felt immune from attack. There was a mood of confidence in all ranks of both the army and the navy at Pearl Harbor. It was a confidence that was to prove unwarranted. Some in Washington knew. The Japanese embassy had been told to destroy their papers and the Americans had decoded the messages. They knew that 1300 hours Washington time was the hour of attack. But where? General Marshall judged it would be a dawn attack. He transmitted a warning to the Philippines, Panama, San Francisco and Hawaii. It ended, just what significance the hour set may have we do not know but be on alert accordingly. 1 p.m. in Washington is dawn at Pearl Harbor. But Marshall's warning was accidentally delayed. It was not decoded at Pearl until seven hours after the attack. The 350 Japanese pilots, specially trained for the attack on Pearl Harbor, were given their final instructions for the operation in the early light of December 7th. Then, as the sun rose over the horizon, they ceremoniously drank a toast to the health of their emperor, Hirohito. The first wave of 180 aircraft took off under the command of Captain Mitsuo Fuchida. There were 90 Kate single-engine bombers under his command, half of them carrying torpedoes, the remainder carrying armor-piercing bombs. There were 51 Val two-seater dive bombers and 43 Zeke fighters. Part of this wave was actually spotted on an American Army radar screen by an Army private that he could contact no one from the Air Force and imagine that the bombers must be flying fortresses passing Hawaii en route to the Philippines. So he told no one. Captain Fushida remembers it today. It was he who gave the historic order to attack. Tora, Tora, Tora. We came over Hawaii at 7.19. When I saw the target, I yelled, Attack! 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 American response to this surprise attack was slow 
The years of peace had dulled their reactions, but more than this, they could not believe it was happening. From the heights overlooking Pearl Harbor, one man saw it all. A young ensign on Sunday leave, now Captain Noel of the United States Navy. He had got up early and was preparing breakfast. I was in the kitchen of our house there, looking out the window while warming the bottle for our child. I could see the entrance to Pearl Harbor, and I was, saw the uh, planes, the smoke, uh, the flame, uh, uh, big splashes of water, and I thought we were seeing some maneuvers that were uh, common enough at that time. At that uh, minute, uh, the captain of my ship uh, telephoned and asked me if I knew what was going on. He had heard over the radio that Pearl Harbor was being attacked. Before leaving for the base, which of course was my first reaction after the initial surprise, I went out to the base as fast as I could. Before leaving, I sent, put my family in the care of our neighbors who were Americans of Japanese origin. And I'd like to underline at this point that uh, no Americans of Japanese origin who lived in the Hawaiian Islands were traitors to the United States. Half an hour, the first wave dived, launching their torpedoes, dropping their bombs. On the airfields, nearly 200 planes were in flames. The Americans lost two and a half thousand men killed. A thousand more were wounded. And yet, the Japanese force of 350 planes that inflicted these casualties on the men and ships at Pearl Harbor lost just 29 planes, less than a tenth. Such was the weakness of the American response. I arrived uh, just during the second attack of the Japanese bombers. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't have a single cannon on board. And this was especially frustrating because during all our practice shooting, uh, we had won the first prize and were considered to be the best gunners in our class uh, in the fleet. In fact, uh, my chief gunner uh, was so frustrated he had nothing to shoot and he was crying with rage. Uh, all we could do was to help put out the fires and evacuate the wounded. All the battleships uh, were hit. Uh, And uh, there was, of course, a great confusion, smoke, a flame, uh, uh, sirens, uh, whistles. Uh, we were near the battleship Pennsylvania, and the Japanese bombs fell all around us. It was a devastating blow to the prestige of the United States. Four battleships lay on the bottom at Pearl Harbor, the rest severely damaged. But six and a half thousand miles away, Admiral Yamamoto heard no news of the two aircraft carriers he had thought were at Pearl. These, the Enterprise and the Lexington, were the real prize. They had left on routine missions before Nagumo's fleet had closed in. Yamamoto's victory was not complete, and these two carriers were to severely affect Japan's plans in the coming months. Nevertheless, as the reports flew round the world and the declarations of war were made, Pearl Harbor seemed to be an overwhelming victory for the people of Japan. But they had not only surprised the Americans, they had been successful elsewhere. But the attack on Pearl Harbor was only the most spectacular of many attacks which the Japanese launched almost simultaneously in several areas to the south and west of their country. Two of their main objectives were Singapore and Hong Kong, strategic centers of the British Empire. Hong Kong was attacked on December the 8th. It fell to the Japanese army on Christmas Day. <laughs> 
Singapore, the richest city of the empire, was said to be invincible. Its defences were strengthened by the Royal Navy's two largest battleships, the Prince of Wales and the Repulse, who had come to these waters to deter the Japanese threat. But when the Japanese torpedo bombers opened the attack on Singapore, they sank both the Prince of Wales and the Repulse as the invasion began. now nothing to stop the troops of General Yamashita from landing on the shores of northern Malaya and moving south towards Singapore. Yamashita, the tiger of Malaya, the Japanese Rommel. Within two months he pushed his troops 300 miles through the jungles of Malaya and the British opposition until he stood along the shores of the narrow straits that separate Singapore Island from the mainland. This was the direction from which the British had thought an attack could never come. After a week of bombardment, Singapore fell. Louis Baum was there. He witnessed the last humiliating moments. The final days of the Battle of Singapore were drawing to a close, and the city was entirely encircled with the troops around the perimeter battling to keep the Japanese out. You can see over there on your right, on your left, rather, Fraser Hill, which was the west front uh, where the Japanese were, had a front line and from where they could overlook the city of Singapore. The conditions in the town at this time were, of course, appalling as one can expect. The, the whole sky was covered with a thick pile of black smoke coming from the, boy, from the burning oil reservoirs of the naval base. The sun couldn't pierce the thick cloud, the roads were cluttered with burnt out vehicles, with buses and trams which had been blown up in the heavy bombardments, the streets and the pavements littered with the dead of civilians, the services were breaking down, the water was broken down, the reservoirs were in the hands of Japanese, there's no more electricity, and the conditions reached a point where General Percival, the military commander, and the civil governor, Shenton Thomas, were forced to come to the decision that from the civil point of view there was only one answer and that was to surrender the city to the Japanese under the best terms possible. How serious was the loss of Singapore to the British? It was a dark period. Churchill was battling at the time uh, at the, one might say, the nadir of the war's history. Rommel was battling at the gates of Alexandria, the Nazis were hammering at the doors of the Kremlin. We in Britain were fighting the battle of the Atlantic. We were trying at the same time to rebuild our factories and industries, to recreate an army to invade Europe eventually. And there was very little to spare in the way of a modern equipment or reinforcements of troops for a distant place like Singapore. It was an in a terrible uh, problem, I think, for the British government to decide whether they should send their few uh, equipment they could spare either to Suez or to Singapore. One had to be sacrificed and it was decided that Suez was the more important and the reinforcements should go there. We had to go without and the inevitable end was the fall of Singapore. My last position was here in the gardens of four houses behind where you're standing. I had four guns, and I was there when Singapore fell. Um, I wasn't actually captured sort of physically by the Japanese. Um, we were, the whole city was, was, was uh, surrendered. But the first Japanese I saw was in the streets around here, because the next day the Japanese didn't occupy the city until Sunday morning. And the next day I took a stroll around, having nothing much else to do, having destroyed my equipment. and. I going, turning around the corner, I saw a Japanese soldier, and I thought I'd meet somebody, you know, fully armed with a uh, submachine gun, tin hat and everything else. And when I saw him, I immediately sort of hid my watch, because I knew that that would be the person who'd disappear. And I saw a little Japanese soldier, he seemed to be no higher than that, um, dressed in sort of shabby-looking clothes to us. Mind you, we weren't all that smart. And I thought, my God, is that the Japanese army? But I didn't stay for long. I went back to my 
uh, gun position. I told the soldiers that, well, the Japanese are in the vicinity. Be careful, uh, you know, they'll be with us before long. Were you badly treated? Uh, personally, not to start with, no. The takeover of the city... The takeover of the city itself was well disciplined. Uh, it was what the one sole concession that the Japanese Yamashita uh, would agree to with General Percival was that uh, the only certain Japanese, the, the disciplined Japanese troops would occupy the city and we insisted on that to avoid a general massacre of the civilian population. They occupied it the following day on the Sunday and personally um, I can't complain. I, had, I, I, I didn't see any more of the Japanese soldiers after that. The tough times were yet to come. They were to follow, yes. General Percival signed the Articles of Surrender. 130,000 men were put into captivity. Another Western outpost had also been dragged into the Japanese embrace, the Philippines. Here, on the 8th of December, the day after Pearl Harbor, the American Air Force was taken by surprise and half destroyed within an hour. A week later, little remained of American air power in the Philippines. The Japanese planes ruled the skies over Manila. Its extensive shipyards were now untenable as a base for the U.S. fleet, and Manila was declared an open city by General MacArthur on the day after Christmas, 1941. Japanese civilians came out of their cellars to cheer the victorious General Homa. As Singapore fell to the Japanese armies, General MacArthur's troops were being cut off in the Bataan Peninsula. For three months they held out without food, with no hope of reinforcements. By March, the Americans knew the situation was hopeless. President Roosevelt ordered MacArthur to leave for Australia. A fortnight later, the men left in Bataan were forced to surrender. 70,000 of them now began the famous Death March. 55 miles from Marivelle to San Fernando. Between seven and 10,000 of these men died on the way. But it was not over yet. The Americans still had a toehold in the Philippines. The four forts in the Bay of Manila. Of these, Fort Mills on Corregidor, MacArthur's former headquarters, held out for another month. It had always seemed impregnable with its giant cannons and the network of tunnels under Malinta Hill where no bomb could reach. Under constant Japanese attack from land, sea and air, even Corregidor fell. There was no more resistance in the Philippines when the men of Corregidor surrendered. It was not the only loss to the United States in the Western Pacific. Guam and Wake Islands had been taken too, but the Philippines was the major prize. In Tokyo, the crowds were ecstatic. Hong Kong, Singapore, the Philippines. Within a fortnight, they were to hear also of the fall of Burma. A resounding banzai echoed round the empire. General Tojo himself joined in the exultation and the emperor came forth to greet his people. <laughs> 
in the United States, plans for revenge had already begun. Even before the fall of Corregidor, the Americans conceived an attempt to bring the war home to the Japanese, a crazy idea to bomb Tokyo, 10,000 miles from the United States coast. Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle was given the task of training a squadron of B-25 Mitchell twin-engine bombers to take off from an aircraft carrier deck only 90 yards long. And Vice Admiral Halsey was ordered to take 16 of these planes across the Pacific to within striking distance of the Japanese capital. But in mid-Pacific, the plan was spoiled. A Japanese trawler sighted the American aircraft carrier two days before it reached the planned strike position. The trawler was sunk, but Halsey, fearing it may have alerted the Japanese fleet, ordered the B-25 to take off. Pilots knew as they got airborne that they could not return to the carrier. Their only hope after bombing Tokyo was for a safe landing in China. But no one had alerted the Japanese. In Tokyo, it was the Emperor's birthday. The sky was full of planes. Doolittle's raiders flew over Tokyo for some 30 seconds dropped a total of 16 tons of bombs. Then they fled to China. Doolittle remembers. One aeroplane against orders flew to Russia. He had a leak in his gas tank and he flew to Vladivostok because he felt he could not possibly get to China. Uh, the other aeroplanes, the other 15, all proceeded to China. Two of them cracked up on the coast of China, just about out of gasoline, and uh, by the time we got to China, the weather was again very bad. Uh, one of them cracked up on a lake in the interior. Um, the rest of us jumped. So our airplanes were all lost. All 16 of the airplanes were lost. Three of Doolittle's raiders, as they were called in the newspapers, were captured by the Japanese and later executed for war crimes. I felt very badly indeed. I had lost all of my aircraft, my crews were widely dispersed, and uh, I think I have never felt sadder or less successful than I did after the Tokyo raid. Nevertheless, 77 men survived the raid. They were given a triumphant welcome in China by Madame Chiang Kai-shek. On the other hand, the raid did have two desirable uh, results. One is it caused the Japanese people to question their warlord, who had told them that Japan would never be bombed. Two, it gave the folks at home the first good news that they had had. All news prior to that had been unfavorable. The Doolittle raid was important, not simply because it caused the Japanese people to question their military leaders, it also strengthened Admiral Yamamoto's argument that if Japan was to be defended against such raids, the United States fleet would have to be defeated and Japan would have to capture Midway. But this was not yet the concern of the Japanese. Their eyes still looked to the south and the rich oil fields of the Dutch East Indies. These were now secured by a series of lightning raids which took Borneo, the Celebes, Java and Sumatra. But now, the Japanese advance slowed down. In New Guinea, the Australians stuck it out in the dense jungle. They were helped by the local natives, and the Japanese found it hard going. Slowly, the Australians fell back, climbing the central mountain range up the Kokoda track a jungle trail which would get them to Port Moresby on the southern side of the island. The Japanese needed to take Port Moresby 
but they could not get up the Kokoda track. Port Moresby was never captured. It was to prove to be a crucial factor in the war in the Pacific. Ever since the beginning of hostilities, Australia had been within the range of the Japanese bombers, operating either from aircraft carriers or from air bases in the southern territories that the Japanese captured. And even before MacArthur had left the Philippines to set up his base in Australia, the Japanese had bombed Darwin on the northern coast on the 19th of February, with a total of 242 bombers. This raid had sunk several ships, including the United States destroyer Peary, as well as killing over 200 civilians. But the Japanese knew that if they were to seriously hamper the Americans' lines of communication with MacArthur's forces, they would have to control the seas immediately to the north of Australia. And this meant that they needed to capture Port Moresby. It was now becoming obvious that this would be very difficult to take by land, and so a naval assault was prepared. The invasion forces assembled on the 4th of May, 1942, and sailed south from Rabaul into the Coral Sea. But here the Americans were ready. Alerted by their decoding experts, they had moved two aircraft carriers, the Yorktown and Lexington, into the Coral Sea. On the 7th of May, a reconnaissance plane from the Yorktown sighted the Japanese forces. The American planes took off to fight the Japanese ships beyond the horizon. It was to be the first naval battle in history where the opposing commanders could not see the enemy. It was also to be the first time that the Japanese fleet felt the strength of an American carrier-borne strike. As the American torpedo bombers approached the Japanese, the weather worsened. One of the Japanese carriers, the Zui Kaku, was completely obscured by the storm. So the other Japanese carrier, Shakaku, became the main target for the American planes. It was put out of action. But the planes from the Zui Kaku had been launched at the height of the storm. Now they found the American fleet in bright sunshine under blue skies. The Yorktown was hit and seemed on the point of sinking. The Lexington was hit, was blown up by its own arsenal and sunk. The Japanese withdrew and turned their attention to Midway. Yamamoto put together the largest fleet in the world. The Americans, already aware of Yamamoto's plans because they could now decode any Japanese radio signal, called every ship they could to this decisive battle. The severely damaged Yorktown limped back to Pearl Harbor. Engineers estimated it would take them three months to repair it. Admiral Nimitz gave them two days. Somehow, the Yorktown was made seaworthy in time. It meant that the Americans could put three aircraft carriers into the battle. The Enterprise, the Hornet, and the Yorktown. The Americans also had Midway itself. Here, from a small landing strip, flying fortresses could take off. It was a squadron of these flying fortresses on a reconnaissance mission that first spotted the Japanese fleet. As the bombs dropped, the alert was sounded on both sides. It was June the 4th, 1942. The Battle of Midway was about to begin. The Japanese made the first move. Within 15 minutes, 108 planes were in the skies. 
were ready. They sent off a first wave of fighters to defend the island. On Midway itself, most of the planes were off the ground when the Japanese struck and a heavy anti-aircraft barrage helped to keep the runways unharmed. damage. As the Japanese fighter pilots turned back to the carriers, they radioed that a second strike was necessary if Midway was to be taken. It was at this point that Admiral Nagumo, the victor of Pearl Harbor, made a decision that was to turn the course of the battle. He had expected that the first attack on Midway would be sufficient, so he had kept his reserve planes ready to ward off an attack from the American fleet but his reconnaissance planes had not sighted the American fleet at all, so Nagumo now changed his instructions to his bomber crews. They were to unload the torpedoes that they carried to fire against ships and load bombs to drop on Midway. But as they did this, and as the planes stood defenseless on the decks of the carriers, the American fleet came within striking range. First, the Japanese shot the Americans out of the skies. But later, as further attacks mounted, the Americans were successful. Torpedo Squadron 8 was in the thick of it. Of these men, only one survived, Ensign Gay, who became a national hero after the battle. Today, he's a captain for TWA. What were his most vivid impressions of this decisive encounter? My first concern was the zeros that were strafing me in the water. So each time they would come down, I'd dive to get away from them, and, uh, well, it was just trying to survive. minutes, three Japanese aircraft carriers were out of action. Now there was only one Japanese carrier left in the battle, the Hiryu. It sent its last aircraft to sink the Yorktown. The Yorktown was already rudderless and lifting. The deck was a mass of twisted metal. Fire raged everywhere. But now the final attack from the Hiryu's planes made the end inevitable. was soon avenged. The Enterprise sent 40 planes to find the Hiryu, the last Japanese carrier, and destroy it. I saw it all. I was right in the middle of the whole thing. A matter of fact, some of the ships were close enough so that if there had been someone on it that I knew, I could have recognized it. So all the time you were in the water, you were completely surrounded by Japanese? Oh yes, quite a few. And I saw their ships taking them off of their carriers, and their carriers were burning. And uh, of course their airplanes then, right about this time, had come back from Midway. And they were all having to land in the water because their carriers were burning. 
When Admiral Yamamoto first heard the news, he decided to send reinforcements to the battle. But when he learned that all four Japanese aircraft carriers had been lost, he pulled his forces back. He had taken on the American Pacific Fleet and been beaten. Six months of victories were over. The Japanese flood had been stopped. began the long push back. The 7th of August, 1942, Guadalcanal. From here, the Japanese menaced all American lines of communication in the South Pacific. A young Marine, Edwin Morgan, was there. I personally was afraid that I would be afraid, not do my job. There was a great deal of confusion. The first night we even, some units fired at each other. And there was the strangeness of finally seeing the Japanese. They were strange, they were Asian. It was... We were keen and we had the morale was certainly very high. We weren't as well trained as we thought we were, but we were confident. great deal of confusion, the maps were bad, there was confusion as to the names of the rivers and the distances. For instance, we were told that we must take Mount Austin, which is miles away and very 2,000 feet high, the first day. It wasn't taken for months. Henderson Field proved to be the key to the battle for Guadalcanal. The Japanese sent in an elite unit of the Imperial Marines to recapture it, led by one of the heroes of Singapore, Colonel Ichiki. They decided to come around through the jungle and come down this ridge, which leads straight to the airport. There's no obstacle between this ridge and the airport and the sea. It's about a thousand yards long, covered with kunai grass, and on either flank are the valleys of the Lunga River and the Tenaru River. It's a sort of a door to the airport. They attacked on the evening of the 12th, aided by a bombardment of Japanese cruisers at sea, which plastered the ridge. Then they came on in the usual way, uh, almost shoulder to shoulder, all night long. They found here 400 men under Colonel Edson of the Raider Battalion, uh, which suffered heavily but held. more than 700 Japanese dead. They were all dead because the wounded refused to surrender. This is the first taste we had of the Japanese method of, of fighting to the last man. And when our corpsmen approached them to try and help the wounded, they'd explode grenades in their faces, killing themselves and the corpsmen. It was about this time that the campaign began to but we began to become as savage as the Japanese in self-defense. Uh, it became practically a, a fight of extermination. No quarter, no mercy. It's also about this time that disease set in. Dysentery, malaria increased from week to week. Uh, fatigue. We were living in the jungle. We were dirty most of the time. Fighting was more or less constant. The bombardment was constant. 
we began to realize it was going to be long, hard, and brutal. And then came a stroke of luck for the United States that set the seal on the fate of Japan. Admiral Yamamoto, the architect of the victories in the Pacific, the leading Japanese strategist, decided it was time to take a personal appraisal of the worsening situation. He was in control of an immense front based on hundreds of tiny islands, any of which might be the next target. He flew from base to base. On the 17th of April, 1943, he left Rabaul, heading southeast for the Solomon Islands. The Americans knew his exact location. They had intercepted the Japanese radio signals, and from Guadalcanal, 18 P-38 Lightning fighters took off to intercept Yamamoto. They caught him above Bougainville, well inside Japanese territory. His plane was unescorted. The American fighters were too fast for the bomber. the history of Japan was ended. It was Admiral Yamamoto who had said, I will give you six months of victories, but then I can promise nothing. Japan had enjoyed greater victories than any in its history, but as the ashes of Yamamoto were ceremoniously put to rest, Japan's victories were over. Yamamoto must have realized it before his death. was over for Yamamoto, but not for Japan. For the Shinto priests, for the dignities of the court, for Prime Minister Tojo, and for 80 million Japanese, the war would continue. Fifteen major battles of the Second World War. Their impact was enormous and decisive. See newly released documentary footage on the dramatic encounters in the Atlantic and the Pacific. See the great historical battles in Russia, the Normandy landing, the bombing of Berlin, the invasion of Italy. See the big battles of World War II, the fateful encounters upon which hung the destinies of men and nations. See the big battles.